Chapter 14 The Central Sahara Canon Borno The Canon Borno Empire, at its height, flourished in the region of northeastern Nigeria, northern Cameroon, eastern Niger, western Chad, and southern Libya. Once horse born nomads, the Zaghawa built this Canary culture. They created a state renowned for its longevity and political stability. From the late 11th century onwards, its rulers came from the same family, the Sifua. The empire's known history takes us from the early 9th century AD to well into the 19th century. The early monarchs ruled over Kenem, the eastern Niger, and western Chad region. Dugu was the first of their kings, believed to have lived around 800 AD. The dynasty, sometimes called the Dugawa, ruled until 1075. This would appear to have begun as a very humble period. al Yakubi, a noted Arab writer of the age, 872 AD, informs us that the Zaghawa of Kanem had no use for towns and instead lived in huts made of corn stalks. They have no kings of cities, continues Akubi. Their ruler is called Karkar. Among the Zaghawa is a race called Hudin, Futin, who have king who is a Zaghawi. Then there is kingdom of Malal, which is an enemy with the Zaghawi, ruler of Kanem. Their king is called Mai Ume. A century later, the condition of culture had evolved greatly. al Mahalabi, writing in 985 AD, recorded that the Zaghawa kingdom had become important among the African kingdoms. Additionally, it was populous and could boast of two cities, Manan and Terazaki. The government of this time was a divine kingship. In addition, their houses are all of plastered clay, says Mulhalvi, as is also the Kassir, i.e. castle, of their king, whom they extol and worship as if they were God, Most High. They pretend that the king does not eat any ordinary food. For his sustenance, he has a secret body of persons, who take food to his compound so that no one knows where his food comes from. If it so chances that any of his subjects meet the camel which carries the king's food, the man is at once killed on the spot. The king drinks with certain chosen companions. His drink is made from dora, millet, mixed with honey. As clothing, he wears trousers made of thin wool, and over them he is decked out in an upper garment of wool of, pure, of poor quality, prickly and lousy, with silk over that. He is open-handed among his subjects. For the common people, by contrast, things were much more modest. They wore animal skins and subsisted on their own farming, produce supplemented with meat from their own animals. On their farmlands, millet and beans and wheat were cultivated. Al-Idrisi, writing in the 12th century, indicates that Manan was the capital. He further informs us that Nijimi, Another Kinori town was very small and sparsely populated. Furthermore, there was another town of the Zaghawa, wherever this is, that embraced many districts and was well populated. The Zaghawa, however, were conquerors. Oliver and Atmore, two modern historians, relate that the northern Kinori, like other pastoralists, were warlike and mobile, and since early Muslim times, if not before, they had been the main suppliers of slaves to Egypt and Ifriquia from this region. The trade brought them in return to constantly developing weapons and accessories for successful conquests in Sudanese latitudes. The big Barbary horses, so essential to carry the armored knight, the chainmail for the horse and rider, the harness and saddlery, the swords and shields, and heavy metal lances. To monopolize such a golden road to wealth and power and to guard it from rivals to the east and west was an obvious incentive to empire. The So culture, also called Sao, was an earlier and vastly superior civilization that thrived in the same region. Remains of the Sao sediments to the southeast of Lake Chad, says a modern scholar, have been traced back to the 4th century BC. Zaghawa nomads immigrated to the lands of So and lived among them. Using trickery, the Zaghawa gradually took them over and later absorbed them into the Kanori state. G.T. Stride and Carolyn Ifika presented the relevant facts about the So civilization with the characteristic accuracy. 
The So people possessed considerable political and artistic genius. Although they never combined effectively to form an empire, they developed city-states, which were the centers of intense local patriotism. Each city was surrounded by strong defensive walls and dominated the life of surrounding countryside, which it both protected and governed. Government was by an elaborate hierarchy, headed by a divine ruler. Except on ceremonial occasions, the rulers made few public appearances and even remained concealed from the common gaze by a screen. Women occupied a respected position in society, and the queen mother and senior sister of the ruler exercised considerable political influence on the government of the state. The So people were mainly settled farmers, but among them were craftsmen of considerable industrial and artistic merit. They were able to work in both clay and metals to manufacture household utensils, tools, and works of art for religious purposes. Impressive objects found by the archaeologists included burial urns and figures of animals and human beings both in clay and bronze. All this had been achieved before about A.D. 700. The vigor of the government and civilization is best demonstrated by their long resistance to the empires of Canaan and Borno and the fact that many cultural characteristics of the Kanuri were later adopted from the So. During the time of King Arku, 1023-67, the Zaghawa extended their domain northwards into the Sahara. They established control over the trading activities of Muslims in the region. Islam came to have an influence in the royal court itself, though it had little influence anywhere else in the kingdom. Queen Hawa, Arku's successor, became the first Islamic sovereign of Canaan, ruling for four years. An equally short reign followed. During this confusion, Mai, i.e. King, Hume Jilmi took control of the kingdom in 1075. Ending the rule of the Dagawa, he founded the Sefua dynasty. How Islam spread into this region in the first place is not clear. al Bakri. The excellent Spanish geographer of the 11th century left a useful clue. Apparently, refugees from Arabia's Umayyads fled to Canaan to escape the persecution of their political rivals, the Abbasides. We conjecture that Islam spread among the Kanemi from these refugees. Jilmi's son, Mai Danama I, ruled from 1086 until 1140. Dunama I made two pilgrimages to Mecca. He also commanded large cavalry forces in the region for the first time. A subsequent ruler, Mai Salma ibn Bikur, 1183-1210, seized control of the caravan routes to the north, especially to Fizan. The Mai, also a devout Muslim, built a mosque of plaster in the town of Najimi, replacing the older mosque constructed of reeds. His son, Ma Bradu studied 150 books uh, on Islam with the learned Imam Abdullah Dili ibn Bikuru. These two factors control the trade routes and commonality of religion with the Islamic world, led to greater international contacts. In any case, we hear of Abu Ishaq Ibrim al Kanemi, a learned and celebrated poet working at the civil court of the great Almohad Sultan al Mansur. Trade flourished across the Sahara. From the north came horses, fine metalware, glassware, fabrics, and copper. From the west came cola nuts and ivory. From the south came cotton goods. Merchants, merchants traded with Tripoli, Fezzan, and Egypt. Kenim exported slaves, ivory, ostrich feathers, and live animals. In the 13th century, Jimmy became the new capital. From here, official and cultural contacts were established with the world at large. Lady Luggard commented that the 13th century would seem to have been a brilliant period. Mai Dunama ibn Salma, Dunama II, ruled from 1210 to 1248. He built Canem into a great regional power, commanding 30,000 cavalry and an even larger number of infantry. He conducted warfare in the desert. With camels instead of horses, his war machine campaigned against the entire Fezzan region of southern Libya. Crushed were the Balula of the east. Pillaged were the Hausa cities of northern Nigeria. This latter group were compelled to pay tribute. Dr. Davidson reconstructs the scene of 
swinging tassels in the dust, harness brasses that glitter against quilted armor. See also page 432. Long spears, pennoned and pointed, brilliant cavaliers, all the creak and swing and clatter and pomp of an aristocratic army saddled for a sack and loot. With the footsore plebes in goatskin, armed with clubs and spears and small hope, trailing out behind. Such were the warrior columns of the old Sudan, i.e. Africa. The feudal fire and challenge that were thrown, times without number, against the easy marts and watered villages of one imperial region of, after another, now with one side winning, now with the other. Mastery of the trade routes and the spoils of war built large state revenues. Kenemi Muslims established a school in Cairo that gained a considerable reputation. The institution had hostile facilities used by Kenan pilgrims going to or from Mecca or studying at Cairo's Al-Azhar University. Regularly, they sent money for its upkeep. In 1246, Danama II exchanged embassies with al Mustanisir, the king of Tunis. He sent the North African court a costly present, which apparently included a giraffe. An old chronicle noted that the rare animal created a sensation in Tunis. Professor Ronald Cohen penned a good summary of the achievements of this early period in his important study on Canon Borno culture. By the 12th and 13th centuries, Canon became a well-known state in the Islamic world. Trans-Saharan commerce was completely controlled. Garrisons were built to protect the trade routes and treaty relations were established with the Hafsid rulers of Tunis. A traveler's house was constructed in Cairo. At the other extreme of the Islamic world in Spain, a poet from Camden was renowned. For his praise songs, this was a great period of Islamic civilization and Kenem played its part in that fluorescence. Sir Richard Palmer, the pioneering and erudite authority on Canon Borno, seemed equally impressed. In his own words, the degree of civilization achieved by its early rulers would appear to compare favorably with that of the European monarchs of that day. Especially when it's understood that the Christian West had remained ignorant, rude, and barbarous. However, the war against the Bulala highlighted internal problems. Dunama II was a strict Muslim. He converted many of the conquered peoples to Islam and instituted the Quran as the basis for law. Unfortunately, he went much further. He was determined to destroy Kanori traditional religion by demonstrating that it was built on mere su superstition. To demonstrate this, he opened the sacred Mune, a sealed container said to hold the spirit of victory and of such importance that its secrets should never be divulged. Dunama, however, learned the hard way that the unity and power of the empire depended on harmony between the Muslims and the traditionalists. His sacrilegious act of opening the container alienated a large section of the Kanori. Even some of his own sons were appalled. They joined a serious rebellion against him, and the Bulala made a dangerous bid to seek independence from Kanem and to avenge the insult to a religion they shared with the non-Muslim Kanori. Dunama II inflicted a severe defeat on the Bulala, but, it's highlight but it highlights the problems associated with the imposition of Islam against the wishes of the followers of the older ancestral religions. Other wars led to territorial expansion of the empire. The Kenemi conquered and absorbed the land of Gaga, i.e. Borno, in northeastern Nigeria after a jihad. Henceforth, the Mais were known as kings of Kanem and lords of Borno. It is interesting to consider the administration of this vast territory. Dr. Oliver and Dr. Fagan's account on how it worked produced useful information that also throws light on old African matriarchy. Moreover, Oliver and Fagan's research demonstrates the extent to which Canon Borno copied its institutional structures from the conquered So, Despite the evident Muslim piety of many of the Mais, the political structure which emerged in medieval Canem retained strong traces of the pre-Islamic sacral kingship attributed by the al Mahalabi to the Zaghawa, and having many features in common with other states of the Sudanic belt of West Africa. The ruler led a ritually secluded existence, surrounded by titled office holders and palace slaves. As in so many African kingdoms, the highest positions of all were held by two women, known as the Queen Mother and the Queen Sister, each of whom had, their, had her own court and officers. 
The highest male dignitaries were the provincial governors theoretically responsible for the North, the East, the South, and the West. In practice, these seem to have been central privy council posts. The real administration of distant provinces was entrusted to military commanders, often princes of the royal house, each of whom, each of whom surrounded himself with a court and officers on the same pattern as the central one. Sir Richmond Palmer alludes to two more important state officials. There was an astronomer royal and also a reckoner of the months. We note that both positions require a high level of scholarly and scientific endeavor from its incumbents. Problems with the Bulala emerged again in the 14th century. Jil ibn Sukuma, their king, challenged Mai Daud, 1366-76, to and subsequent Mai Umar, 1382-7. to The Bulala campaign forced the latter to abandon Najimi, his ailing capital, and flee to Borno. This left the Bulala ruling in Kanem. Connected with these events, Lady Lugger narrates the story of a Kanem ruler who sought refuge in the house of city of Kano. He came accompanied by a great host of men with fiefs, flags, and drums on horseback. Accompanying the party were Malams, the holy men. In Hausaland, they received shelter as a guest of Sarki Daud, the king of Kano. Taking counsel with his prime minister, the Kano ruler inquired on how best to entertain the Kanem party. The prime minister warned, if you allow this man to stay in one place in one of the towns of your territory, he will take possession of the whole place. They resolved to accommodate the Kanemi in houses built between Kano and the frontier town in an area shaded by locust trees. Fifty years later, the same thing happened again. Another Kanem ruler fled to take refuge in Kano, again without negative con consequences for Hausaland. However, by the late 16th century, the prime minister's gloomy prophecy came true. The Kanemi, under Mai Idris Uluma, did indeed take possession of the whole place. A century before that conquest, however, aspects of Kanori, courtly culture, had already spread to Kano, perhaps brought there by the Kanem re refugee prince. The Kano court came to adopt the use of the royal trumpet, the wearing of ostrich feather sandals, and the sporting of ostrich feather fans. Furthermore, the Kano court paraded the unmounted horses of the ruler, all following the Kanori fashion. Borno, Gaga, was of great economic importance to the Kanemi. It was a source of animal products, foodstuffs, ivory, ostrich feathers, and slaves, products that were used domestically and also exported north across the Sahara. Glass was among the pro products sold to Borno. However, some of the indigenous people forged trade links with Kano, one of the city-states in northern Nigeria, instead. This created a web of trade links between Borno, Kano, Takeda, an important commercial and distribution center, and North Africa. This attempt to divert trade away from Kenem was an important reason for Kenem's continued military actions in Borno. The ascension of the Ali ibn Dunama, also known as Ali Gaji, in 1465 ushered in a glorious epic. He instituted governmental, military, and religious reforms. He was also a great patron of scholars. Rather than risk further defeats at the hands of the Bulala, he consolidated power in Borno where he established a new capital. Founded around 1484, he built the city of Ngazaru Gamu near the river Yobi. Although in ruins today, it is still possible to distinguish a large complex of unique red brick construction. This was apparently the palace of the Mais. Other red brick ruins were the homes of the leading persons. An overwhelming seven-meter-high rampart approached through five entrances encircled this central area. It covered six square kilometers. Lastly, Ali Gaji, like his Songhai contemporary Sony Ali, achieved world renown. His state, Borno, appears on the Portuguese map of 1489. The 16th century was associated with greater town and city life. Some of the towns at Ali Gajiri, Damask, Difa, Duji, Gashagar, Wudi, and Yo developed into considerable urban centers where pottery, weaving, leatherwork, and dyeing flourished. Borno leather paid for the important European manufactured goods, perfumes, ornaments, etc. Great luxury was associated with this period. According to Leo Africanus, 
The emperor's cavalry had golden stirrups, spurs, bits, and buckles. Even the ruler's dogs had chains of the finest gold. Raymond Michelet, author of informative essay on African history, affirm affirms that the 16th century was one of the immense prosperity. The northern country was opened by irrigation and the Touregs driven back, so that at this time the kingdom of Songhai, the house estates, or rather the house of Kebi kingdom, and the Borno Kanem kingdom formed a notable chain of empires along the same latitude, and all equally prosperous. This prosperity lasted in Canem Borno for 200 years until the beginning of the 19th century. In this period, the Sefwa dynasty reconquered Kanem, exchanged embassies with Tripoli, and maintained trade and intercourse with the Turkish Empire, sending six ambassadors to Istanbul in 1574. My Idris Aluma, 1564-96, was the most successful pol politician of the period who gained considerable international prestige. Muhammad Kati, the great Songhai historian, wrote that the mass of our contemporaries hold that there are four sultans, not counting the supreme sultan, the sultan of Constantinople, to wit, the sultan of Baghdad, the sultan of Cairo, the sultan of Borno, and the sultan of Meli, i.e. Mali. Dr. Henrik Barth, the 19th century German traveler, described Idris as an excellent prince uniting in himself the most opposite qualities warlike energy combined with mildness and intelligence courage and with circumspection and patience severity with pious feelings his military prowess was outstanding with armies possibly the first in africa to have muskets acquiring them from the turkish empire north south east and west he carried his conquering arms says lady luggard to give a list of the many peoples that he subdued could only weary the reader Imam Ahmad, the royal chronicler and aide, wrote a detailed account of Idris as his companions. Part of his first-hand report reads as follows. Abdul Jalil ibn B fled and escaped, fearing our army. He had left his wife, the daughter of Urima, in his house, turning from her when he saw the dust of our army rising to the skies. For he was certain that the safety of man himself is better for him than the safety of his wife. So he fled, deserting his wife, since personal necessity is more compelling than the lack of a wife, as the author of the book, Ifrika, has said. Idris reformed and standardized the judiciary by establishing a system of Islamic courts. He himself ruled according to the Islamic political theory, taking a stand against, among other things, immorality in the capital. Oliver and Atmore wrote that he presided over a court famous for the high standard of its legal and theological disputations. Like his Songhai contemporaries, he was a patron of learning, encouraging scholars from many other African countries to take up residence in Borno. He improved navigation on the Yobi River. He commissioned the building of a longer, flat-bottomed boats initially for his navy. For land transportation, he imported a much greater number of camels, replacing the dependence on mules, oxen, and donkeys. The Great Mai was also a builder. Raising new brick mosques in the cities that replaced the older buildings, he also founded a hostel in Mecca for Borno pilgrims. Following the fall of Songhai in 1591, the Great Mai became the undisputed champion of the Muslims in the region. The empire became the Borno Caliphate. Philip Coslow, a modern historian, declared that his contemporary, Elizabeth I of England, a shrewd and strong-willed monarch who gave her name to an age, has been repeatedly celebrated in books and films, could hardly have claimed greater achievements in war, administration, or diplomacy. The achievements of Idris, however, like that of the other canon rulers, owed much to the advice and direction given by the Queen Mother. Idris's mother, Queen Amsa, ruled a short while before her son's succession. Of this queen, Lady Luggard says, she was a very distinguished woman, to whose advice it is believed that her son owed much of the, the wisdom of his conduct. Under her influence, an important embassy was sent to Tripoli, and the policy of maintaining intercourse and trade with the outer world by the medium of the Turkish Empire, which had always been the policy of prosperous Borno, was actively developed. The Caliphate in the 17th century presented an image of strength and power to the outside world, repulsing invaders from all sides. The Kanori ruled as far as north as Mursuk to the hills of Darfur in the east and as well as Borno to the southwest. 
Their monarchs are remembered as pious Muslims and patrons of Islamic scholarship. Mai Muhammad and his two successors, Ibrahim and Umar, ruled over half a century of eternal peace and security. The Mai was largely a secluded religious figure, as in pre-Islamic times. In practice, day-to-day -day government lay in the hands of 12 key dignitaries. As before, these included the commander of the armed forces, the commander of the various provinces, the heir apparent, the queen mother, and the queen sister. Garzargamu, the capital city, burst its shell, becoming one of the largest cities on earth at the time. By 1658, the metropolis, according to architectural scholar Susan Denner, housed about a quarter of a million people. It had 660 streets. Many were wide and unbending, reflective of town planning. The dendal, or high streets, were lined on both sides by trees that offered shade. Four Friday mosques, each used by 12,000 worshippers at the time, served religious needs. These buildings must have been erected on an impressive scale. Moreover, the construction techniques in general were sophisticated. Heinrich Barth, who inspected the remains of these walls during the 19th century, says a modern scholar, declared that their workmanship was equal in quality to the finest masonry he had seen in Europe. Dr. Davidson calls this the harvest time of Canon Bornu civilization. He notes that though a little though little is known about the way of life for ordinary people during this period, we may well imagine that they made the best of these peaceful years. Farmers could work their fields in safety, travelers and pilgrims could follow the roads without fear, those who lived in towns and market villages could prosper with the spread of trade that came both from everyday security and from unified rule over the wide country. There was growth of learning in the towns and of schools in the villages. There was regular traffic between Can and Bornu and the Egyptian and Tunisian provinces of the Turkish Empire in North Africa. The tranquility was challenged by two serious invasions in 1667. Mai Ali successfully fought off both the Turegs of the desert and the Junkun from the eastern Nigeria region. Both groups raided the capital in search of booty. Dan Marina, a contemporary at the Hassa University of Katsina, composed a poem dedicated to the Borno Caliph. This literary offering shows, for good or ill, how African Muslims came to view traditionalist enemies. Ali has triumphed over the heathen, i.e. Jankun, a matchless triumph in the path of God, no sultan like him, a lathe among lathes, ever stout of heart. Has he not brought us, i.e. Muslims, succor? Verily, but for him... Our hearts have never ceased from dread of the unbelievers. Never had become to us the earth pressed by the foe, till Ali saved our children and their children yet unborn. O people, say with one accord, may God grant him recompense for our deliverance. He drove back to the furthest borders the army of the Jankun, and God scattered their host disheartened. Though the empire survived the invasions, there was great famine that took place towards the end of the 17th century, the first of the series. The terminal decline and breakup of the empire began towards the very end of the 18th century, possibly prompted by economic factors. The caliphate lost control of an important desert trade in salt in the Touregs. The Touareg interruption of the trade routes caused a series of famines in the southern part of the empire. The Fulanis, another people in the region whose power was ascending, occupied the capital in 1808 and destroyed it in 1812. All of these led to both the decline of the caliphate and the breakdown of its internal cohesion. The Hausa Confederation. The Hausa Confederation consisted of seven independent cities and their surrounding territories. See page 314. Known as the Hausa Bakwai or pure Hausa states, the cities were Gobir, Biram, Katsina, Kano, Dora, Reno, and Zazao. Gobir was the most northerly and Zazao the most southerly. They flourished in the region of northern Nigeria from the 11th and 12th centuries to the early 20th century. Though linked by language for most of their history, the Hausa never formed a unifying territory. Scholars thus describe them as a confederacy of independent states. Hausa historians also claim kinship with the other states in the Nigeria region, known as Banzai, Bakwai, or impure Hausa states. These were Zamfara, Kebi, Gwari, Nup, Yoruba, and Kwararafa. In truth, the other cities were not part of the Hausa territories, but their histories are linked with those of the Hausa. What is known about the early history of the Hausa Bakwai, however, is very uneven. In particular, little of the, little of the history seems to be currently known of Biram, Dora, and Reno. Canon Robinson, the pioneering Hausa scholar, wrote that, according to the mythical genealogy of the Hausas, their original ancestor was Biram. 
Lady Lugger confirms this. She related a tradition that Biram was the father of the states. He has six children of whom Zaria, i.e. Zazao, and Katsena were first born as twins. Then Kano and Rano, another pair of twins, and after them, Gober and Dora. To each of his children, the progenitor of Hausa states is said to have assigned certain duties. Gober, the most northerly of the states, which is historic times, served as military rampart between peaceful Hausa land and the warlike tribes of the desert, was appointed war chief with special duty of defending his brethren. Kano and Rano, safe behind this rampart, were appointed ministers of industry. Dying, weaving, Katsena and Dora were ministers of intercourse and trade, and Zaria, which is a province of great extent to the south of the others, and dividing their fruitful plains from the hilly country of Bachi, was appointed chief of slaves, with the special duty of supplying labor for the industry of his brothers. Was Biram really the first of the house of states? Did it really direct the culture of the other cities? Historians do not know. Concerning Dara and Reno, Lady Luggert wrote, Dara would seem to have been one of the most ancient of Hausa states, and references to it are frequent in the Kano Chronicle, but like its sister Reno, it does not appear to have played a very important public part in the history known to us of Hausa land. The Burni, a walled village, was the original basis of each state, Distinguished from an ordinary village of ha or hamlet, the walls enclosed a large self-sufficient community where trade, industry, and agriculture took place. Moreover, villagers from the surrounding rural, rural areas would enter the Burney in times of emergency caused by threats from the enemy armies. Each Burney was designed to withstand blockades. Within the walls, exchange took place between farmers and craftsmen. The houses unified the different Burney and hamlets into towns, and the most important became capital cities. The capitals governed the hundreds of other walled villages and held this seat of government. Each capital, an elaborate hierarchy and administration, evolved. To give some context, Lord Lugger, the husband of Lady Lugger, estimated in 1904 that there were 170 walled towns still in existence in the whole of the Kano province alone. Bagwada became the first house of Sarki, i.e. king, ruling Kano from 999 A.D., to 1063. The Kano Chronicle portrays him as a conqueror who seized power over the settlement of Dala. At the settlement, a culture flourished among the Abagawiawa. Rock paintings were found at the Burnin Kudu. Additionally, iron working was found dating to 700 AD. Other evidence indicates the existence of mining. In addition, the Abagayawa established settlements around Dala, such as Gazarawa, Zadawa, Fanganzora, Dunduzawa, Sharia, Shim, Gande Giji, and Tokarawa. Some of these settlements were towns. Worshippers of the Tsumburburai, the priests made once yearly sacrifices of black animals in the grove of Jakara. In Dala, there was an important shrine to this deity, which was a sacred tree called Shamuz. Per Professor J. Spencer Tringingham claims this early culture belonged to the So civilization and says they were characterized by matrilineal succession in the ruling class and also walled towns. Professor Moughton, an architectural scholar, wrote the urbanism in the region was stimulated by trade and iron smelting, which dates back to the earlier part of the first millennium A.D. Sarki Bagwada fired the first shot against the religion of the Abagayawa, however. He destroyed the sacred grove of Tsumburborai. The third Sarki of this line, Bagada's grandson, Gijimasu, raised the first great walls of Kano City in the late 11th or early 12th century. Subsequent rulers asserted authority, not just in the city, but also in the localities. During the reign of Sarki, the fifth Sarki, the first walls of Kano were completed, 1136 to 63. He also armed his soldiers with shields made of sturdy hides. This allowed Kano to both govern and protect the people of the surrounding royal communities. Sarki and Naguji, a successor, had a long reign of 53 years, 1194 to 1247. He imposed an annual land tax equal to one-eighth of each worker's produce. 
Stride and Ifika contextualize these developments as follows. Thus, there developed an administrative system capable of dealing with the affairs of a political unit larger than a village community. Conflict sometimes arose between the city dwellers and of royal communities. The Kano Chronicle, the important house of history, tells us of counselors coming to Sarki Shikaru in 1290 to warn him of rising tensions in the countryside. The counselors thought stern measures should be taken against the peasants, but Shakarel had other ideas. He received a delegation from the peasants at the royal palace and listened patiently to their eloquent arguments for local autonomy. According to the chronicle, the Sarki left them with their power and their own religious customs. Baron de Masu became the next ruler in 1307. Of this ruler, the Kano Chronicle recorded that he excelled all men in courage, dignity, impetuosity in war, vindictiveness, and strength. The Chronicle relates that the anthem, Stand Firm, Kano is Your City, was composed during this time. Moreover, three-foot-long trumpets were introduced into state rituals. Islam began to make its presence felt during the time of his successor, introduced by Wangarians from Mali. Sarki Yaji, 1349-85, enlisted Wangarian support in an attack upon Santolo, a neighboring city. The Malians promised their support, but only on one condition. They demanded that the Sarki adopt Islam and appoint Islamic officials. Yaji complied. Following his conquest of Santolo and the surrounding rural areas, he converted and built the first mosque in Kano, beneath the Shamuz shrine. The Abagayawa were insulted. They contemptuously used the mosque as a lavatory. Yaji was forced to establish a patrol to guard the building. Elsewhere in Hausaland, Islam was introduced. In Katsina of the 15th century, the minaret of Muhammad Khural is still a landmark in the city. In Zaria, by contrast, Islam made no progress until the 19th century. The 15th century was eventful with brilliant reforms, some inspired by Canon Borno. Abdullah Borja, the 18th ruler of Kano, was the architect of great prosperity. In 1438, he was crowned Sarki of Kano on the death of Sarki Dodd. Within a few years, he became the most powerful Sarkuna in the House of Confederation. His general led military campaigns for seven years in the regions to the south. The campaigns attempted to open the trade route to Guanja on the edge of the forest belt. The Kano cavalry, typical of the time, were equipped with plumed iron helmets and chainmail. Their horses were protected with lefiti, a thick quilted armor made of cloth. Burja's raids proved successful. 21,000 prisoners were captured. The general dispatched the captives to 21 settlements in Kano City. From Guanja, though, from Guanja through this newly opened trade route, cola nuts and gold dust flowed into the Kano. Meanwhile, serious diplomatic problems had emerged with Borno. The Kano Chronicle attempts to put a brave face on it, but admits that after the conflict, many towns were given to Borno. This indicates that Burja was defeated in whatever it was the authors of the Chronicle were trying to conceal. The city of Kano remained independent and surprisingly direct trade was established with Borno despite the conflict. Moreover, the Sarki sent gifts to the ruler of Borno, acknowledging the Bono Mai's supremacy as an Islamic leader. This started a tradition that continued late into the 18th century. Of the House of Rulers, Abdullah Borja was the first to encourage the use of camels as beasts of burden. Previously, Kano businessmen and traders waited on camel caravans controlled by the Tuaregs to arrive from the north. Under Borja's new policy, Kano merchants could transport their own goods across the desert. In the footsteps of these merchants followed the Hausa language and culture. Hausa became the biggest indigenous language spoken in Africa after Swahili. In reputation, Hausa merchants came to rival the legendary Wangarian merchants of Guinea. The Economic Powerhouse Behind Mali It was worth remembering that the BBC in the Millennium series described Mali as the richest empire in the 14th century world. In Kano Borja established the Kormi Market, a veritable magnet it attracted goods from all over the world. Yakubu succeeded Borja in 1452. Pursuing a policy of peace and commerce, large numbers of Malian immigrants settled in Kano. Developing the intellectual culture of the city, these Fulani intellectuals introduced the Islamic teachings of dogmatics and grammar. This added to the already established teachings of jurisprudence and the Hadith. 
Yakubu set the stage for his brilliant successor, Sarki Muhammad Ramfa. Ramfa became ruler of Kano in 1463. He greatly extended the walls of the city and built an imposing new palace, the Gidan Ramfa, with courtly attendants adopting fashions from Borno. They wore extravagant sandals of ostrich feathers and sported fans from the same bird. His principal officers built palaces of their own. Reforming the government, he appointed a nine-member council of advisors and promoted slaves to important positions. Slaves managed the treasury, staffed the palace, attended the harem, and policed the city. He enforced Islamic law. Humiliating the Abagawa, he compelled leading citizens to become Muslims and built a Friday mosque on the sacred Shamoz site. Women were kept in Purda. Additionally, Eid al fir the great Islamic festival after Ramadan, was celebrated for the first time. He offered active support to scholars. One famous scholar, Sheikh Muhammad al makhili taught Quranic studies in Katsina and Law of Kano. He wrote a treatise on government called On the Obligations of Princes. One excerpt from this great work reads as follows. The surgeon of prince in the city breeds all manner and trouble and harm. The bird of prey abides in open and wild places. Vigorous is the cock as he struts round his domains. The eagle can only win his realm by firm resolve, and the cock's voice is strong as he masters the hens. Ride, then, the horses of resolution upon the saddles of prudence. Cherish the land from the spoiling drought, from the raging wind, the dust-laden storm, the raucous thunder, the gleaming lightning, the shattering fireball, and the beating rain. Kingdoms are held by the sword, not by delays. Can fear be thrust back except by causing fear? Allow only the nearest of your friends to bring you food and drink and bed and clothes. Do not part with your coat of mail and weapons and let no one approach you save men of trust and virtue. Never sleep in a place of peril. Have near to guard you at all times a band of faithful and gallant men, sentries, bowmen, horse and foot. Times of alarm are not like times of safety. Conceal your secrets from other people until you master of your undertaking. In this work, Rumpha was advised to install an ombudsman to receive complaints against the government. Rumpha put the advice into practice and al Maghili left for the Songhai city of Gao in 1502. The only significant failure of his career was an inconclusive 11-year war conducted against Katsina. The Kano Chronicle says of him, he can have no equal in might from the time of the founding of Kano until it shall end. From this period on, Lady Luggard says, Kano may be reckoned with the civilized native powers of the Sudan, i.e. Africa. Skirmishes with Katsina continued intermittently until a truce was agreed in 1706. Though all these battles were ultimately inconclusive, Katsina emerged supreme. Songhai under Askia, the Great, seized Kano in around 1512. Sarki Muhammad Kisoki gave one of his daughters in marriage to es Eskia. Like the rest of Hasalan, Kano became part of Songhai Empire for the greater part of the 16th century. For most of the 18th century, Kano fell under the hegemony of Borno. Bernan Katsina was established in 15th century under Muhammad Koral, 1444-94. The Derbys were the original masters of the Katsina territories. They were ancestralists, and their domination began in the 12th century. Controlling the markets and fairs of the region, they established hegemony over Bernan Samri, Tasegaro, and Yandaka. In the 15th century, however, new iron working in what became Bernan Katsina undermined the economic stranglehold of the Derbies. Moreover, new populations migrated into the area with foreign religious ideology. The Berberi entered from Borno, the Wangara and the Fulanis came from the west, and the Absenwa came from the north. They brought Islam. Thus, when Muhammad Karal gained mastery of the region, Katsina was already a cosmopolitan Islamic city with a flourishing iron-working industry. In around 1493, the scholarly and brilliantly Sheikh Muhammad al Maghili visited the city. He converted Karal, the ruler, and also helped him to establish Islam on a more solid basis. The independence of the city, however, was undermined in the early 16th century. The Songhai under Askia the Great conquered Katsina. During this period, however, trade with the Tunis brought great prosperity. 
In 1554, Katsina became independent of Songhai. Ali Morabas, one of the greater Katsina rulers, built the powerful outer walls in around 1560. Zazao in the 15th century had various fortified places such as the Turunku and Kufina. Zarya City, however, dates back to 1536. Bakwa Turunku founded it after conquering Kufina. Apparently, Turunku, her previous capital, lacked sufficient sources of water to support the growing needs of her commercial center. On her death in 1566, Karama, a soldier, succeeded her. Princess Amina, Turunku's daughter, accompanied him on campaigns. In 1576, Amina became the undisputed ruler of Zazao. Distinguished as a soldier and an empire builder, she led campaigns. She had walled forts built as an area garrisons to consolidate the territory conquered after each campaign. Some of these forts still stand today. Amina subdued the whole area between Zazao and the Niger and Benyuv rivers, absorbing the Noop and Kwarafara states. The Kano Chronicle says every town paid her tribute. The Sarkin Noop, i.e. King of Noop, sent her 40 eunuchs and 10,000 kolas. In her time, all the products of the West came to Hausalan. The southern expansion provided large supplies of slave labor. Additionally, Zazao came to control the trade route from Guanja and began to benefit from the trade previously enjoyed only by Kano and Katsina. Noob to the south of Zazao had some distant cultural relationship with the Hausa. They enjoyed a high reputation for quality of their craftsmanship in brass, silver, and glass manufacture. They were also skilled as boat builders for war and trade. Sarki Sode welded the Noop peoples into state in the early 15th century. He built large forces of cavalry and led the Noop on a program of territorial expansion. They subdued the Yagba, Bunu, and Kakanda, and may have driven the Yoruba from their second capital of Old Oyo. Moving north, they conquered the Ibi, Kamberi, and Kamuku areas. Soidi founded the city of Gabara on the lower Kaduna River. On the opposite side, he founded the city of Dokomba. Originally a stable for his 1,000 horses, Dokomba became the main city after Gabara outgrew itself. Gabara could no longer serve the requirements of the court, the army, and the cavalry. Unique among the House of States, there are nine surviving bronze masterpieces of controversial origins, but associated with the Sarki Sode. See page 447. They are comparable in style and quality to the brilliant metal art of the Yoruba and Benin. Moreover, both the Leipzig and the British museums continue to house elaborate brass vessels, urns, daggers, hilts, etc. of the Noop manufacture and several centuries old. Some date to the 15th century. Kebi was located to the west of the other cities. It was another of the Banzai Bakwai, an impure house estate. Muhammad Kanta founded it in an early 16th century. The son of Katsina Princess, he had an extraordinary career. A brilliant soldier, his army was the only one to withstand the hegemony of Songhai. Some accounts accepted trimming by Trimmingham and Stride and Ifika claim he overthrew Songhai imperial power in Hausaland and imposed tribute on these captured territories himself. Less controversially, he found it imposing cities, the ruins of which are still in existence. Surame, the capital of Kebi, proved almost impregnable. Surrounded by a moat, it had seven concentric, concentric stone and clay walls. Philip Coslow, a modern historian, suggests that the wall construction involved a workforce of 10,000 people. Gungu, another of Kanta's constructions, was a garrison town. Finally, Lika was the holiday residence for the royal family. By the 15th or 16th centuries, according to Philip Coslow, all the house of cities had emerged with the customary walls and also trade links with the north. Of the walls themselves, we are told that, at Kano, for example, there is a great mud wall, some 11 miles in length, with 13 gates in all. Lord Luggert, writing in 1902, described it about 40 feet in height. Even in its present ruined state, it is a noble monument. At Zaria, a similar wall has practically disappeared, except for some sort, short lengths near a few of the gates. Each city was divided into wards and subdivided into family compounds. An elder headed each compound. Typically, he supervised repairs to the walls of the city that became necessary after the rainy seasons. 
Kano and Katsina were bustling industrial industrial centers of activity associated with cotton goods, leather manufacture, agriculture, iron smelting, weaving, and dyeing. Noop specialized in brass, silver, and glass manufacture. The royalty of Noop and Kebby boasted copper sheath boats of local manufacture. The House of Confederation traded with the Yoruba to the south, bought a Khan gold from the west, and traded with Egypt and the rest of the North Africa. Some of these commercial activities were given a new impetuous cause by the breakup and fall of Songhai in 1591. Although referring to a later period, a modern scholar noted that it has been estimated that in 1851, the city of Kano exported 10 million pairs of sandals, 5 million hides and sheepskins each year to North Africa. Additionally, for several centuries, says another scholar, the best leather bindings for European books came from Nigeria for the Morocco leather, so-called because Europe imported it via Morocco, is made from Nigerian goatskin. The Kano market was the most important venue for the buying and selling of these products. Canon Charles Robinson, a Cambridge University authority on Hausa studies, definitively described this institution. Writing in 1900, he declared the following, Kano may claim to possess the largest marketplace, not merely in Africa, but in the world. The French traveler, Colonel Montoul, is estimated its average daily attendance at 30,000, and though I should not have ventured on quite so large as one myself, I do not think that this estimate is very extravagant. Size, moreover, is the least interesting feature of the Kano market. In the first place, its antiquity is deserving of notice. The market has probably been held on the exact site where we now find it for at least a thousand years. At the time of the Norman conquest of England, i.e. 1066 AD, trade was being conducted in the Kano market amidst surroundings closely resembling those that we now see. Kano would then have furnished better May cloth than any to be found in England at the time. Each state was typically governed by a council composed of the great ministers. Apart from the Sarki, there were the Galadima, his deputy or heir apparent, the Matawaki, the commander-in-chief, the Magaji, the minister of finance, and the Yari, the chief of prisons, the Sarkin Dogori, the head of the royal bodyguard, and the Sarkin Yandoka, the chief of police. The Matawaki was the second most important official on the council. Apart from the ceremonial functions, he advised the king on appointments to high office. He was also on the panel of king makers. Local government was in the hands of the village heads. Some of these were royally appointed. Justice was administered by the Al-Kali, who administered the Maliki law in the light of local traditions. Appeals could be made up to the chief of Al-Kali. In the villages, however, the village head decided upon minor issues. Taxes were imposed on movable property, livestock, annual production, and as tribute on conquered states. Citizens paid in kind. Tribute was sometimes paid by supplying of slaves. Kano was a large as Kano was as large as Songhai capital of Gao. A survey of 1585 suggested that Gao had a population of at least 100,000 people. Kano had a planning policy to keep only half the city as residential. This may indicate a Kano population of between 50,000 and 100,000. We are informed by Leo Africanus, a Moorish contemporary, that the inhabitants are rich merchants and are most civil people. Their king was in times past of great puissance and had mighty troops of horsemen at his command. Katsina of the mid-16th century was more imposing with a circuit of 13 or 14 miles. Divided into a hundred residential quarters, it was a cosmopolitan city. It had quarters for the Boronese, the Malians, the Songhai, the Asben, the Arabs, and people of Gobir. It boasted industrial quarters for the saddlers, shoemakers, and dyers, and workshops for smiths and tailors. There were warehouses of textiles, salt and lead, and great halls for the conduct of business. There was an official or government quarter. The Sarkis Palace itself developed into a complex of stores, halls, stables, and houses. Elsewhere, there were schools and mosques. And as in all great towns, there was a student's quarters. The outlying region could grow tobacco, indigo, yam, melons, pomegranates, and many other foodstuffs. Sarame, even in ruin, was an impressive site. Built on a horizontal vertical grid, Mr. E. J. Arnett, a modern scholar, describes it as thus. 
The walls of Sarame are about 10 miles in circumference and include many large bastions or walled suburbs running out at a right angles to the main wall. The large compound in Kanta is still visible in the center with ruins of many buildings, one of which is said to have been two-storied. The striking feature of the walls and whole ruins is the extensive use of stone and tsukwa, laterite gravel, or very hard red building mud. Evidently brought from a distance, there is a big mound of this near the north gate about 8 feet in height. The walls show regular courses of masonry to height of 20 feet and more in several places. The best preserved portion is that known as the Sarati, the bridge, a little north of the eastern gate. The main city walls here appear to have provided a very strongly guarded entrance about 30 feet wide, approached from left and right by a passage deepening to the point of entrance and sloping up from there into the town. The entrance, however, is filled with a solid masonry wall in remarkable preservation. It stands from 25 to 30 feet high. From its name, Sarati, or bridge, it is probable that the entrance gateway of the town was surmounted by an archway or bridge. Sarame is said to have been abandoned by the successors of Kanta about 1715 AD. The fall of Timbuktu in 1591 left Kitsina the leading intellectual center of West Africa. Lady Luggard suggests that it seems to have been regarded as a sort of university town. Abu Abdallah Muhammad ibn Muhammad, 1595-1667, also called Dan Masani, was its most celebrated scholar. He wrote on the law, theology, poetry, politics, and even on the wonders of Yoruba land. Furthermore, he wrote a 500-page commentary on the Ishrinia of Al-Fazi, he also wrote a treatise on rebellion and one on Maliki law. Muhammad ibn Muhammad, an astronomer and mathematician, wrote an interesting paper on the theory of mathematical chronograms, also known as magic squares. Moreover, the city itself flourished as a trading center. An account from the 18th century describes Kutsina as follows. The rich men boasted of their houses full of gold and silver. Every rich man had a square house which they filled with gold and silver. And the result was that it was a city of vainglory. It had seven gates, and in it were seven pal and in it were seven places of treasure. One of them was the store of gold from the Gugas Gate to Yandaka Gate, and the Ma Adanwa warehouses of salt from the Gate of Guga to the Gate of Marusa. And outside the town, Kuali antimony, silver, tin, and lead, and the and the places from the market of Dorama. To inside Al Baba. Lady Luggard even noticed that the manners of Katsina were distinguished by superior politeness over those of the other towns. Gobir in the 18th and 19th centuries became the most powerful state of the House of Confederation. Early in the 18th century, Gobir began to exploit the power vacuum left by the failing Kebi. Sarki Barbari ruled from 1742 to 1770. His armies marched against Samfra. Maradi, Katsina, Yuri, and Noop. They extracted tribute from Kano. However, Gobir itself faced a far more powerful threat from the Fulanis. Austere and fanatical in their religion, they no longer tolerated the laxness and growing corruption of the House of Rulers. In 1804, they revolted against these regimes, declaring jihad on the rulers. William Winwood Reed, author of The Martyrdom of Man, gave an account on the relevant facts. Othman, Danfodio, the black prophet, went out of Mecca, his soul burning with zeal. He determined to reform the Sudan, i.e. that part of Africa. Danfodio sent letters to the great kings of Timbuktu, Hausa, and Bornu, commanding them to reform their own lives and those of their subjects, or he would chastise them in the name of God. Danfodio united the Fula, i.e. Fulani, tribes into an army which he inspired with his own spirit. Thirsting for plunder and paradise, the Fulas swept over the Sudan. They marched into battle with shouts of frenzy joy, singing hymns and waving their green flags on which texts of the Quran were embroidered, embroidered in letters of gold. Many ordinary houses joined the Fulani campaigns. They empathized with the Fulani attack on the luxury, injustice, and high taxation associated with the House of Sarkunas, i.e. kings. Moreover, the government officials were not above confiscating lives, livestock and other goods of ordinary people, nor were they above capturing young women to serve in the harem. In 1812, the shihu, meaning teacher, 
Uthman Dan Fodio triumphed over the House of Kings. Ruling from Gobir, he changed the name of the city to Sokoto. The empire he built became the Sokoto Caliphate. Establishing a centralized government, he began a stability in the region that ultimately created an economic boom. House of Land had seen nothing like it since the 15th and 16th centuries. Kano cotton, for example, clothed half of West Africa. Furthermore, the Shihu and the descendants were scholars of impressive intellects. Dr. Davidson wrote that the Uthman, his brother, Abadullah, and his son, Muhammad Bello, are attributed to some 258 books and essays on a variety of theoretical and practical subjects. Between 1822 and 1830, two English travelers, Dixon Denham and Hugh Clapperton, visited the caliphate and also Borno. They recorded that the Palace of Cano possessed a mosque and several towers three or four stories high. Dr. Barth visited there in 1854 and estimated the population of Hausaland at 50 million people. The best concise description of the caliphate and also Borno, however, comes again from the pen of William Winwood Reed. He wrote a splendid summary of what the Englishmen witnessed on their travels. Denham and Clapperton were astonished to find among the Negroes a magnificent courts, regiments of cavalry, the horses caparisoned in silk for gala days and clad in coats of mail for war, long trains of camels laden with salt and natron and corn and cloth and cowry shells, which form the currency, and the kola nuts, which Arabs call the coffee of the Negroes. They attended with the wonder the gigantic fairs at which the cotton goods of Manchester, the red cloth of Saxony, double-barreled guns, razors, tea and sugar, Nuremberg ware, and writing paper were exhibited for sale. They also found merchants who offered to cash their bills upon houses at Tripoli, and scholars acquainted with Aficina, Averroes, and their Greek philosophers. Things were falling apart, however. Canon Robinson paints a picture of great instability due to the different city slaves raiding each other. Although Robinson himself suggests otherwise, this could have only severely disrupted the social and economic life in our opinion. Slaves were sold in markets at Cano and elsewhere. The fall of this culture is associated with the military activities of the British. In 1903, their armies overthrew the Sokoto Caliphate. They incorporated the captured territory with the conquered lands of Benin, Igbo, and Yoruba to form the modern state of Nigeria. Note on the role of Islam in African culture. Dr. Leo Frobenius, the great German Africanist, was among the first to refute the notion that the civilizations of West Africa and the Central Sahara were of Arab inspiration. See page 362. Nevertheless, misconceptions continue to persist. What is less well known is that the Arabic script, used in many of these civilizations, was in fact of African origin. Ibn Khaliqan, the great biographer of Middle Ages, claimed that Abul Aswan, an African, invented the Arabic script. Furthermore, the greatest literature of the Arabs was penned by blacks, including Luckman, Antar, Ibrahim al-Mahdi, and the greatest intellect of them all, al-Jahiz. On the genesis of Islam, one cannot overlook the outstanding contribution of Bilal, an Ethiopian, who was considered one-third of the origin of that religion, where Allah was the first part and Muhammad was the second. In addition, the Kaaba of Mecca, the only substantial piece of early Islamic architecture in the entire Saudi Arabian region, was rebuilt in its present form by Ethiopian architects. See page 466. It should also be acknowledged that Christianity, like Islam, is also partly of African origin. Among those outstanding Africans who brought glory to the early church were Tertullian, Perpetua, St. Cyprian, and the Venerable St. Augustine. In conclusion, the presence of Christianity in early Europe, despite its non-European origins, does not de-Europeanize Europe historical achievements any more than the presence of Islam in early West and Central Africa de-Africanizes African historical achievements.